Have you ever felt like, I just hate this. I am so done with this. It is so bad. I'm ready for the good. God, take this away. I am ready for the blessing. Whether that be in motherhood, when your kids are pushing you past your limits, or in your job, when the demands are stronger than you feel you have capacity for, or it's just in the everyday trials facing chronic illness, or those bills piling up, or your marriage definitely defined as the opposite of easy. (laughs) Today, we are going to tackle this lie that hard equals bad. And we are hearing from the expert on it all. Abby Helberstad, best-selling author of MS for Mama, and now with her new release, Hard is Not the Same Thing as Bad. To trade this lie for the truth that even in the hard, God is good and has good, and this can be good too. Let's figure it out together. Here's the deal. On any given day, we think 50,000 to 80,000 thoughts, but get this. Of those, let's say 50,000, 98% of them are the same ones from yesterday, which means we just keep thinking the same stuff over and over and over again, which is great if it's all true, all encouraging, lovely, praiseworthy, but with the father of the lies on the loose, out to steal your hope, kill your peace, and destroy your faith, my guess is they're not. I know you because I know me. Hi, I'm Heidi Lee Anderson, Christian author, cancer survivor, and social media content creator. And in every episode of the Trade a Lie for a Truth podcast, we're camping out on one thought and picking up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, to follow the voice of truth above all else. His name is Jesus. Because in his words, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You ready? Let's seize the free abundant life in Christ one thought at a time, starting with this episode. Abby is in the house. M is for mama. If you know her, you love her. But Abby, before we dive in, I would love it if we could play a little game of two truths and a lie to get to know you. So I want you to say three statements about yourself and I'm going to do my best. We all are going to do our best to see if we can detect the lie. Are you ready? Sure. Yeah. All right. Lay it on me. (laughs) Okay. The first one is that I speak Spanish fluently. Okay. The second one is that I had my first child at 18. Okay. And the third is that I lived in Israel for a while. Whoa. Okay. Y'all, if you don't know, Abby is a mom of 10. So I mean, to think if you had your first baby at 18, it's plausible. I'm not so sure about this, but I'm going to guess that one is the truth. But Israel for some, I didn't know that. Mm. I'm going to go with, is Israel the lie? It is not. What? When did you live there? (laughs) When I was very small. um, My parents actually lived there as labor missionaries twice. My dad was in the oil field and worked there. And they lived on a kibbutz with Druzis, which are actually Arabs who live and are Israeli citizens and fight like with the Israeli army. It's kind of crazy. And um, my brother was born there. He's four years older than I am. And then they went back when they had me. Well, after they had me. So I was like three and four, but I have like very distinct memories from being in Israel. Wow. Oh, okay. So have you gone back as an adult? When did no. you leave? How old were you when you moved four. away? So we were there for a year when I was ages three to four. And then a I year see. when my brother was born too. But he's gone back quite a few times. Okay. That is incredible. I have always wanted to visit Israel. I haven't made the trek over, but it seems like everyone who's gone has had the scriptures come alive, right? You right. can actually yeah. see these events and these places and actually know some of the structures still stand and how crazy that is. Yeah. Wow. That is a very cool, fun fact. Okay, so the lie is Spanish? No, the lie is when I have my kid. Shit. <laughs> oh, so I totally failed this time. Okay, when did you no, have I, your I, first? I went for the plausible lie. Because you're right. I have a lot of kids, so it seems it seems like I would have <laughs> Um, well, I did have a baby early, but I was 23. Okay. And then how old were you when you had your last baby right now? So I have three-year-old twins and I was 37, but almost 38. I was like 37 with, with 11 days to go kind of thing. That's amazing. Okay. So your kids range from how old to how young? So my oldest will be 18 in May and okay. my youngest two are three and a half or right at it. Wow. So you are in the throes of so many different stages of motherhood about right every now. Stage there is, but like like full-on adult and we're almost there <laughs> legally almost. I guess I know I guess 18 he is there I'm excited to dive in because today we are tackling the lie that hard equals bad and to help us set the stage I would love it if you shared more about yourself and maybe when you first started hearing this lie I'd love to hear it 
Yeah. So I, um, she, I think you said I have a lot of kids. I do. I have 10 kids and yes. I think that would probably be enough for um, our culture to consider my life hard. Like if they knew 100%. nothing else, right? because we all know if we're moms that children come with challenges. And there are difficulties you're going to face, whether it's breastfeeding, whether it's the delivery of the baby, whether it's sleepless nights for three straight years, whether it's tantrums or disabilities or chronic illness or just phases that they go through that you kind of feel like you're never going to get out of. And yeah. that at this point, I've weathered with 10 toddlers, for example, the toddler phase being one that moms really kind of freak out about, and understandably so, that I've now weathered 10 times or in, in the process of weathering yet again, times two. And so I think that probably it's the defining heart of my life that's the most ongoing for the last yeah. almost 18 years, but it's probably not the most suffering that I've endured. Sure. And so I think it's important to define our terms when we're talking mm. about hard. And we can yeah. do more of that later, but I come from a Christian background, but my parents are essentially first generation Christians. My mom, okay. I think, had a mom who loved the Lord, but just had a lot of baggage and really struggles. Her dad was not a believer. My dad's parents were definitely not believers. So there was a lot of generational sin coming down the pipe that they were really suffering from the consequences of, and the Lord convicted their hearts to be the chain breakers. I talk about that in my book. So I have been able to reap the benefits of that, but you you know, you don't just escape it in one generation. You know, we, we have things that linger and hurts that are hard to heal. And yet we know a great God who is able yeah. to meet us in the hard, not, not rescue us from it every single time. He lets us walk yeah. through it, but to meet us in it. So I met my husband, Sean, 20-ish years ago, and we've been married for 19 years in June. And um, we actually have two sets of twins. So we've done this twin thing twice. Um, I love that. How did you meet your husband? Uh, we technically met at a 20-somethings volleyball like pickup <sighs> game. Like I saw him across the room. It. But we really didn't connect because he was just a seeker. And if you okay. told me that I was going to marry a guy who had not been a believer until like a week and a half before we started dating, I was been like, no way, because yeah. I've been a Christian since I was five, yeah. you know, just raised, marinated in scripture, have one of those quote unquote boring testimonies where it's like, I love the Lord my whole life. And he's just kind of slowly been chipping away at the things yeah. that we all need chipping away at. But I think that despite the fact that I will always say that we are all sinners, that all have fallen short of the glory of God and that all of our righteousnesses as filthy rags, we all have a different story. And I think that mm -hmm. the Lord gives some of us the capacity or at least the grace in our life circumstances to be more poised toward an easy shift. And my husband yeah. was that kind of person. He was kind. He okay. was honorable. He was hardworking. He was truthful mm. before he knew Jesus. Okay. And then once he came to know Jesus and he'd had some spiritual instruction, he had just kind of labeled yeah. himself a deist, I would say. Like God exists, but he's not personal. Yeah. And he found himself in a very bleak place because that is a very bleak existence of like, well, yes. there is a supreme being, but he doesn't care about me personally. And so hmm. once the light of the truth that God cared about him very personally to the point of dying on the cross for his sins pierced his mind, all of that stuff that he did for the sake of, quote, being good was given yeah. a purpose and all of these layers of an opportunity to glorify God. So it wasn't a huge wow. shift in his behavior, but it was a shift in mindset. So I was oh, able yeah. to date him pretty early on after that. And he was just running on the path toward the Lord, which was great because we have been running that. on that together. Oh, it's, well, it's fun to see him pop up on Instagram and it's fun to see him parent with you. I mean, it's just been fun to watch. So yeah. Well, okay. Very cool. I love how you say that we all face... I mean, whether it's in the middle of motherhood with the toddler years, maybe it's later on with our career, maybe it's in our marriage, but we all face like everyday trials, right? And it's sure. tempting, you say, to ask like, why me, Lord? Even the disciples, as they walked alongside Jesus, they asked this question. I love when they came across the blind man in John 9, they asked Jesus straight up, like, Jesus, why was this man born blind? Was it his sins or was it his parents' sins? Mm -hmm. And I love mm -hmm. how Jesus, I mean, he nipped that in the bud. He says, no, it's not because of his sins or his parents' sins. So, I mean, we see clearly in scripture that, yeah, while we do live in a broken world and we all sin and at times face its consequences, that's not 
always why we face hard things, right? I mean, Jesus says in that case that this happens so the power of God could be seen in him. So sometimes when I wonder that question myself, like why me, Lord? That's how God has answered it sometimes for me that while I may not see the purpose now or even anything good out of it, I do know that he always brings purpose. And I will I will see that someday, but maybe it's come so the power of God could be seen in me and through me as long as I submit to him. That's kind of helped me face the heart, but I'd love to hear your perspective, Abby. Like, how has God answered this question, why me for you? Well, and I wanted to piggyback off of what you just said, because I think what you're yeah. saying is profound and simple at the same time. We live yeah. in a world that is extremely, where the culture tells us that being extremely self-focused is healthy. That kind yeah. of navel gazing and orbiting ourselves is the way to know thyself. Um, the problem is very rarely are we very honest in our self-examination. We're more concerned kind of about our own comfort often or about how someone else mistreated us. So the Bible is called a rock of offense. Jesus is called like a stumbling block to those who yeah. don't believe. And so what you just said, this idea that the Lord might give us something hard to go through, true suffering, even like being blind for the sake of working out his glory and power in us, I think would be really offensive to a non-believer. Like, excuse yeah. me, it's about him and his yeah. glory. And I'm the one that has to suffer as a result of it. And yet we also get this incredible privilege, like the scripture talks about in sharing in his sufferings, because he suffered more than we ever could even imagine on the cross, yeah. bearing the weight of the sin on, of the world on his shoulders. And so we are given this like thing that's called a mystery that we can't really understand of the ability to suffer with Christ, even though we couldn't die for ourselves. And mm-hmm. once the Holy Spirit kind of enlivens your senses and opens your mind to see that that's a privilege. That's not a punishment. It really changes your perspective. I'll give you a really silly example of a way that the Lord has used something inconvenient and frustrating to mature me, but also give me a story that helps others. So I've been pregnant more than eight. I've I've delivered. Okay. I've delivered 10 babies. I've (laughs) had eight births, you know, like birth experiences because two of them were twins. And then I've had a couple of miscarriages. And so I've been pregnant a lot of times and I carry babies for a really long time. I have some sort of ironclad uterus that does not let babies out early. (laughs) And ask any mom that's gotten to 40 weeks and that baby is showing no signs of showing up anytime soon, whether this is a form of like hardship or suffering or a genuine challenge when rolling over in bed is a monumental effort and you have to pee five times a night and you're getting migraines and round (laughs) ligaments are on fire every time you stand up. You know, it's just, it's such a physical marathon of an experience to partner with God to bring life into this world. And I've done it a bunch of times so I can speak to that frustration. And oddly enough, the only time I have truly had a quote unquote early baby was with my first. Oh, really? Head trip when all of the rest of your babies stay in for forever. (laughs) So... So he came six days early and I had no Braxton Hicks with him. I started having some Braxton Hicks with my second and I was like, oh, here we go. Like, this is it. Yeah. Three weeks later, I had a baby at 42 weeks. It's kind of a frivolous example. Like the baby came out, but you get so in your head about like being the first person to be pregnant for the rest of her life and, you know, the baby never coming out and all this stuff. And it it is, it's a mental game and it can really mess with you and wear you down. So then along came number three. 42 weeks. Along came numbers four and five, 39 weeks and four days with two babies inside of me. Um, Number six, 41 weeks and like three days. Number seven, 42 weeks on the dot. Number eight, took the the record with 17 days overdue. So it's been interesting to see how the Lord keeps giving me the same challenge, but also maturing my perspective so Uh. that I no longer resent those last two weeks that I have to quote unquote do longer than most women, you know, kind of thing. I look at them as opportunities to bake cookies with my kids, to go on dates with my husband, to go on walks with my best friend. Like it's almost like, you know what? I'm not gonna be able to do any of this for like a while after this baby comes. So let's just kind of carpe diem and give yourself some freedom. And so I get messages from people all the time that are in that headspace of 
I'm so frustrated. I am crawling up the walls. I'm you know, mm. scratching the paint off of the table. I'm, I'm losing my mind. And the Lord has mm. just given me that perspective of this too shall pass. You're going to be okay. That baby will come, which are so basic, but yes. I can speak to it personally because I've been through it so many times. So someone would accept it from me as opposed yeah. to someone that's like, I've always had early babies, but you're going to be fine. So I think sometimes yeah. even with that, that's kind of a silly example. Not silly. It's not silly. Right. It's, you know, it's a, it's a life-giving example rather than an example of true suffering. Sometimes I think the Lord gives yeah. us not only our hard things to work out his power in us and to give him glory, but also to give us the kind of agency that allows us to speak with authority into other people's lives and encourage them. And mm. I think that that's so important. I want to call it two things that you say, because I think they were so key for us to realize, especially when we're in the thick of the heart. And I love how one, you say we can get in our head. And sometimes we, we believe that lie, like this is going to last forever. This is what I'm in. And it's not just like, okay, someday it'll be over. No, I feel like I am in it and I can't see hope that things will ever change. But we know in scripture yeah. that there's a season for everything under the sun, right? So no matter what we're facing, when we're here on earth, it is truly just a season and there is yeah. another one coming so we can keep holding on. But I also love what you called it out that with every pregnancy, it felt like the Lord had sharpened your perspective a little bit and you were able to rebound or at least attack that lie a little little quicker. And I've totally seen that in my own life. For me, when I am battling against health symptoms and I have my annual oncology appointments coming up, there have been times where in the beginning, I would get these flaming darts of like dwelling on what if worst case scenarios, and it would kind of put me in a funk however yeah. long. And I've just noticed that even as I still face those same darts, just like you said, the Lord has allowed you to face the same situation and trial over and over. I'm actually finding, okay, Hey Lord, I am able to rebound a little bit faster. I don't entertain that lie or sink in that doubt as long as I used to. Like you're you're giving me the stamina, the endurance, the, the strength to kick back. And it reminds me, I wanted to pull up this verse because I loved Romans 5 3 that our suffering it produces perseverance and perseverance mm -hmm. character and mm -hmm. character hope. And, yeah. and we get that as Christians, right? That the Lord, when He allows something in our life, well, the good fruit that comes from from it is that it produces endurance. You can bank on that. And then you can bank on it producing more character. And then you can bank on that even producing more hope. So I love yeah, I that. I love was that, that hope does not disappoint. Like yes. it's not just a hope. It's not just like, I hope we get to go to the movie tonight, but you know, someone might get sick. It's like, yes. Jesus is there and he follows through yes. and the hope becomes a reality yes. because of what he's done for us. Yeah. So good. Honey. Yeah. Commercial break. Guess what? My mom created the coolest thing called Travel Food Passion Week, an eight-day devotional with an easy one-page script. But the best part, there's a daily puzzle piece coloring pages, and by the end of the eight days, you'll finish the whole map of Jerusalem, like literally following Jesus' footsteps. Grab it now when it's under $10. <music> Now, fast forward today, because I love your saying, you are known for the saying that hard isn't the same thing as bad. So much so that your new book is titled that, and I love your book. I love that line because I think we so easily equate anything uncomfortable or anything uneasy as just bad, right? And we wish it away. Yeah. But can, can you help us maybe bridge the way to this truth? Like, how did you go from feeling weighed down by maybe everyday trials to now free by this truth, living lightly in this truth. I think we'd all love to know that secret. <laughs> so I feel like my mom did this for me and we can do this for our kids. We can take everyday struggles or even suffering. Yeah. And we can say to our kids just what we've been saying. We can preach truth to them. This is not the end. This is only a season. And the thing is, if we truly believe, like Paul believes, that to live is Christ and to die is gain, then sometimes that season is our life. Mm -hmm. So what I mean is someone may not be healed of being crippled their entire life, but our life yeah. is but a vapor in the grand scheme of eternity. You don't say that to someone that's suffering. You don't, you're like, ah, your life is a vapor. It's fine. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. Jesus, that's, that's, not, that's not how we function when we're weeping with those who weep and mourning with those who mourn. But at the same yeah. time, as we are using discernment and as we are being wise 
in telling how much of a story is suffering versus just challenges. When we see those challenges, we can frame them for our children. We can help our friends frame them. We can frame them for our peers or or even people that are older than we are because I've gotten so much feedback on this book from people that are in like their 70s and they're like, this is stuff I need to hear. And I'm like, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. it's, it's principles that are in scripture. It's not just specific to a particular age or just moms. We can, we can encourage that there's this process of refining and redeeming and refining and redeeming throughout our lives. And so my mom did such a good job of that for me. If I experienced the disappointment, I was going to get a hug. You know, she might make my favorite meal that night, but if it was a really big blow, we might go thrifting, you know, together um, instead of do some more laundry or whatever. I was homeschooled. So we spent a lot of time together anyway. But so she, she would speak to the need. She was like, dig deep into Jesus, Abby. Like he hasn't left you. He hasn't forsaken you. This isn't for your detriment. He is working all things together for good for those who, who love him and are called according to his purpose. And that's not a throwaway verse, even though we use it a whole lot. And so I feel like I benefited from that greatly. I do also feel like one of the reasons why the Lord has given me this message is my personality is, is kind of naturally tenacious. Like maybe to the extent of a little bit too much of the, oh, well, that's the hard version. So I'm going to do that. So I <laughs> I have to rein that in sometimes and say, just because hard is not the same thing as bad, which is true. You can't just yeah. automatically equate the two. Sometimes it's not the same thing as good to run okay. headlong into something that is going to make your family stressed out or ruin yeah. your health or become an obsession. So I think it's all about discernment. It's all about listening to the Lord's leading and learning to recognize those areas where he's like, I've got you. It's my strength, not yours keep going mm -hmm. to use the, to use the birth analogy. Again, my number seven was my hardest birth. He's the only one I could deliver in the water. I kept trying to deliver babies in the water and my labor would just stop. Like just, okay. nope, sorry. You don't get to do this the easy way. Not, not that it's easy, but like the water's called what a natural epidural and they're like, no, not happening. Yes. He, his was a freight train and I couldn't have stopped that labor if I wanted. I just remember so many contractions for the two hours I was in that water saying, I can't do this. This is too oh. much pain for me. My back is going to break. Yeah. Lord, you're going to have to do this one. And he did one at a time huh. over and over. I have no idea how many of them until that yeah. baby was born. So I think just having that foundation laid by a mom who exemplified it, going through some really, really hard things in her life and continues to, yeah. and then being given practical opportunities to kind of either jump at it or rein it in a little bit and yeah. learn some it's a lifelong process for sure. You know, that reminded me my last baby Dottie, the week before I had gotten an ultrasound because I had wondered if she was too quote unquote big, which we know babies are not, too, we can push them out no matter how big they are, right? Anyways, they just wanted to know what range we're talking about. And they said, you know, she's measuring around nine pounds and all my babies were nine pounds. So they're like, that's good. That's normal. Well, fast forward to when I was pushing her out, I will always remember I ended up getting an epidural, but only half of it work so I could still feel half of it on half of my side and not on the other which felt so cruel but when I was pushy near the end I remember looking at Tyler and saying I can't do this she's too big I can feel her and I can't do this and I will always remember the doctor overheard me and said Heidi you just have one more push and she's out. You can do this. And like you said, how you had your mom, it wasn't just a one-time conversation where she's like, Abby, keep looking to the Lord. No, she, it sounds like consistently and routinely walked you through that and you just need to do it one step at a time. And, yeah. and that's a good thing for us to remember when it's hard. We don't have to always project into the future all the challenges ahead. You know, like it's today. Yes. We have yes. enough trouble of its own. So let's yes. just take the step today and, and come alongside each other like your mom had you and you're teaching us through your book, through your social media platform. Let's you link arms and unite as believers and help each other take just that next step, right? Right. right. And there is so much victory and things to celebrate and satisfaction and joy in the Lord when you push that baby out that you didn't think you could push out. Yes. When you see the progress in your child who has been stuck in this really mm -hmm. hard phase for a year and a half. When you see yourself finally starting to break out of some bad habits that felt like they had you in a prison for 10 yeah. years. And you could say, wow, Lord, I didn't, I didn't know I could do that. And of course the yeah. answer is you couldn't without me. But exactly through me, you know, I can do all things through Christ. And it's not yes. just the I can climb a mountain, but it's like I can do the daily hard 
Because yeah. Paul is talking about, I can just be content in my circumstances yes. of making it through those days when I haven't had enough sleep, when I don't have enough food, or those days when it's just easy, easy yeah. sailing, you know? So it's both, I think. Yeah. And like you said, like that verse, I mean, since we know the Bible is truth, let's talk about a Bible character that maybe faced some hard things, but it wasn't bad. Rather, maybe clearly we see good came from it. I would love to hear your example. I mean, for sure, me personally, I always think of Elijah. He's this powerhouse of the faith, right? And we know that he has this God contest in the midst of hundreds of unbelievers, people that are following this false God. And he hosts this showdown, like, let's pray and let's ask God, whoever is the one true God, to rain down fire, and he will. And that's exactly what happens. I mean, God honors that and fire comes down and everyone knows. And you'd think after this all-time high that he would just be so confident. But instead, mm. Jezebel comes along and... And she mm. throws this death threat in his face and he ends up being so afraid. It says he runs for his life. But what I love in the midst of that is that when he does that, God meets him there, right? We read this angel is sent to take care of him. Mm. And not only that, but he provides another guy to do ministry with him. That's when yeah. Elisha comes along. Like, I love it. God gives us some bread, our actual physical need, and then he gives us what we need next. But how I want to wrap that up is James 5, 17. When we flip over to the New Testament, I mean, James calls out Elijah was a man just like us. He yeah. prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it didn't rain for three and a half years. So just as Elijah felt like us when we are facing hard things, maybe when we're feeling anxious or just spent and we are done with the hard circumstances, we can be like Elijah and pray earnestly. And we know our God would never forsake his own. He'll take care of us. He'll give us what we need. So I'd love to hear from you. Like, is there a Bible character or a passage that, that sticks out to you when you think of this concept? You know, We've been studying Ruth at church on Sundays and oh, yeah. um, she is such a cool example to me of someone who did the next right thing, regardless of how hard or uncomfortable it was. I'm sure your listeners know the story, but basically Ruth is a Moabite. She has a sister-in-law named Orpah, I believe. Her mother is Naomi. They are Israelites who have immigrated to Moab in search of food because there's a famine in Israel on the day of the judges. And then not only does Naomi's husband die, but then Ruth's husband husband dies, which is Naomi's son, and Orpah's husband dies, which is also Naomi's son. And so Naomi decides to return to her people, and she wants to change her name to Mara, which means bitterness. So to some extent, Naomi has given up. Like, she just believes her life to be spent, that she has nothing left to give, that she has nothing more to offer, and she's basically going to go home and die. So Ruth and Orpah want to go with her. Obviously, she's been a good mother-in-law that they would want to go with her, but they probably lived as a family unit since very, very early in their lives. People got married really young. And so they're going to go with her. And she says, no, turn back. I don't have any more sons. And even if I did have sons, what are you going to do? Wait for them to grow up. And Orpah goes home and she's weeping. It's very hard for her. But Ruth does that really famous speech of where you go, I will go. And your mm -hmm. God will be my God. And she follows Naomi to her homeland, to a place she's never been with people who probably don't speak a language that she's super familiar with. Maybe she speaks Hebrew well because she's been married to a Hebrew man. I don't know. And then she is in completely a stranger in a strange land. And let's face it, Naomi is not a ball of sunshine. I mean, she's suffering and she's struggling. And Ruth is the one being a pillar of strength for her, even though she hasn't been taught God's ways up to this point. She's probably just only seen kind of a version of them that they were practicing, hopefully, in some way in a foreign land. And then Naomi goes through this sequence of things that she asks Ruth to do that are phenomenally uncomfortable, right up to the point where she asks her to go lie down at the feet of a man that she doesn't know at night in a country, in a people group, where if they had found her there, they could have stoned her to death for being a wayward woman yeah. and cover herself with his garment, which was basically claiming his protection over her. And if he didn't want her and he took that garment away, she was going to be done. She was going to be killed. She was going to be mm. shunned at the very least. And yet you see the Lord's provision for every single step of the way. 
Boaz, who is the guy that she's laying down at the feet of, turns out to be a really decent dude. And he has his workers like leave sheaves for her. It's just such a practical example of the Lord's provision day to day, what she needed. And then not only that, but this guy takes her under his protection, marries her and Ruth is in the line of Jesus. So because of her obedience through the hard, she Mm -hmm. is listed as the great, 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 great grandmother of our savior. Goodness. Talk about bringing glory to God and his power at work within her. But my skin just crawls at some of the things that she had to do and Mm. how incredibly challenging they must have been in the midst of her suffering because she was also grieving her dead husband and her dead father-in-law and her dead brother-in-law. So I think her courage is really inspiring. And I love that you brought up that story because like you said, Ruth and Naomi, I mean, they faced very similar circumstances in the fact that both their husbands passed away. They both each moved to a foreign land at some point, but at this time they have no money, no future, no security. But yet we see Ruth clinging to God and we see Mara, Naomi, clinging to bitterness. And this reminds me of a line from your book. You write, every stage of motherhood or of life has this possibility of producing so much joy and maturity in our lives as Bible-believing Christians. And the deciding factor of whether the emotional scales will tip in the direction of, this is so hard, I hate it, or this is worth the effort, I am grateful I get to do this, is almost always the perspective with which we view the struggle. And it all comes down to perspective then. How are we viewing what we're facing? So how would you say, do you seize and live in that kind of holy perspective? Like maybe do you have verses you especially cling to in these moments, or maybe even practically speaking, when you're about to lose your cool, you want to give up, you are just done with what you're facing. How do you pivot and walk down the thankful path? Like, do you have any tips for us? Man, I tell you what, I literally preach to myself, like out loud. You will find me talking to myself in my laundry room. I sound like (laughs) a crazy person and I'm totally okay with that. (laughs) But I will literally say out loud, Abby Halberstadt, the Lord is not against you. He is Hmm. for you. You have dealt with worse than this before. I know it's not fun. You don't have to think it's fun. That's not what the Lord's requiring of you. You have to give thanks for what you can give thanks for. And then as cheesy as it sounds, you look for the ways that the Lord is blessing you in that moment. And you start doing goofy stuff like I have a washing machine that will wash my clothes for me and I am not, you know, beating them out on a rock. Now, I want to pause because there's a difference between preaching that truth to yourself, which is very true, and doing it to someone else who is suffering. Maybe you've heard the term toxic positivity that's kind of being thrown around a lot. Now, I think it's thrown around too much and used way too broadly to basically bash anyone who says, let's look for ways to be grateful. Let's look for the good. There is always something good, even if it is the change that the Lord brings in our hearts through a circumstance that's really bad. So the circumstance may not be good at all, but the Lord working in our heart can still produce fruit and that is good. But toxic positivity would look more like someone else is suffering and you go in and go, do you realize it could always be worse? Are you aware that there are people Mm -hmm. in Africa? You know, like that's not really our place. That's not what we're called to do, but we are called to cling to truth. And sometimes Mm -hmm. that looks like speaking the truth out loud to yourself, not because you're being toxically positive, not because you're saying, I love this. This is my favorite. When my twin toddlers melt down on the ground or when my teenager completely forgets to turn off the water and we have a flood in the laundry room or when, (laughs) you know, the toilet overflows and like three people have already done their business in there. (laughs) going to be doing like toe touches and high fives. And (laughs) like, if I'd had a menu of life, I would have ordered this exact circumstance. Lord, thanks. But I think there is something to like stopping that runaway freight train of our wild thoughts into the, how dare you? And I'm so angry and I didn't deserve this. And I've done everything right. And saying, "Uh -uh, Mm. uh oh, no, no, I Mm. don't deserve anything but death and punishment without the transforming power of Christ within me and the grace of his blood on the cross. So what a gift it is. Oh man, like I said, some people are going to get mad at this. What a gift it is to scrub out these poopy pants again. I don't have to like it, but I can still, I always say this. This is something, a phrase that I wrote in him is for mama. Rejoicing always is not the same thing as enjoying always. Oh, I love that like, this is my favorite thing. You just have to not descend into since I hate it, (laughs) since I, I dislike it so much, I will cling to the right 
to be bitter about it. Hmm. I love it. And I love it when you say preaching to yourself. I mean, that's biblical. We see that in the Psalms, even with David. I wanted to pull up Psalm 42. It says, so I say to my soul, don't be discouraged. Don't be disturbed. Yes, um, be for I know yes. my God. Yes, exactly. My God is with me and he will pull me through. And so you're right. Sometimes it takes just us repeating the truth to ourselves, right? Because we know that that's what will set us free. Jesus said, when you know the truth, it will set yes. us free. And I think what you just said is so important. We can't preach scriptural truth to yourself because I am absolutely quoting scripture to myself. Those moments when I'm kind of giving myself a pep talk, but we can't do that if we don't know it. And we mm. have an epidemic of biblical literacy in our culture. We yeah. have an epidemic of people that would like to be spoon fed spiritual truths without having to kind of do the hard work of learning them themselves yeah. or having to do the hard work of repetitive scriptural inundation. The Bible calls it the washing of the water with the word. And it's this idea of like renewing your mind, like it talks about in Romans, by drenching it in scripture, by placing truth in front of your eyes over and over and over again until you can do exactly what your podcast is all about. Spot the lie. <sighs> It's work. And especially when you start out with scripture, it's uncomfortable because you might not understand. You might have to get out the concordance a lot. You might have to go look at commentaries and you might have to read it three times. I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I think no. that it's like learning any other skill where we have to flex muscles and get stronger that we find that the next year when we read through the Bible, if we do something like that, you're like, oh, I remember this story and it makes so much more sense to me because the Lord is faithful. Kind of like I was talking about with the example of doing better each time I went past my due date. He's faithful to gradually reveal his truth to us. I think if we got all of God's truth at once, our minds might explode. We would probably not be able to grasp or comprehend or I mean, the Bible talks about the fact that we really can't comprehend. We haven't given any wisdom to God and we can't comprehend the full scope of what he's doing. But he does, he is faithful to give us little bits at a time that make us hungry for more. And I think that's by design. I love that, Abby. So I think now, I mean, what it all comes down to when we are facing this lie that hard equals bad, hard is bad. I want us to remember the truth of Jeremiah 32, 17. It says, ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your your great power and by your outstretched arm, nothing is too hard for you. So just because it's hard for us, the good news is it does not mean it is hard for God. And the further good news is we are one in Christ, us believers, right? We are united with Christ. So his power, he extends to you. Ephesians yes. 1, 8 through 10, I think of what Paul pleaded to the Ephesians. And he said, I pray that you may know his yes. incomparably great power for us who believe. That's the power that's the same as the might, his mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated yes. him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. And so God wants you to know that today, that his incomparably great power is for you in the everyday moments, in the trials, in the struggle, he is with you. And he not only wants to help you, he wants to fight your battles. So thank you so much for joining us, Abby. Now the way to end every episode it's my favorite part, actually, but we do just a lightning round of quick icebreaker questions. I have five. Just give your knee jerk reaction. Whatever comes to mind is fun. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Number one, if you could bring back one of these boy bands, which would it be? DC Talk or the original Newsboys? Oh, boy, DC Talk. I was obsessed with DC Talk. That one's easy. I was too. That one is solid. And where are they? It's like, we would all love a return. I know. I think actually that um, K-Max has denied his faith. So we know where he is. Oh, okay. See, I was I was a little unaware of that. So they <laughs> the other, there right now. Okay, okay. The other two are still walking with Jesus. So that's good. But let me tell you, I can still do the entire rap to quite a few of their songs. <laughs> it's just the best. Okay, number two. How long have you been using your current Bible? Um... My current Bible is a one-year Bible. I think it's called Expressions Chronological Journaling Bible. I've been using it for two years. Okay. I've typically done the one-year Bible where it's sectioned out into like Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs. And this one goes yeah. chronologically, which is really interesting historically because you're like, oh, I didn't know that that was in the middle of that. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm on my second time through that. Really cool. All right. That's awesome. I love that. I'll have to check it out. Number three, what is one prayer request God has answered this year? Well, 
our house flooded last nice. August. So the entire yeah. downstairs, we built this house ourselves. So my husband and his dad, my husband did a ton of the work and my husband and his dad did like 80% of the work. And then we finished out a ton of it after we moved in. So it's kind of like, you know, sweating your brow type thing. Yeah. And the entire downstairs flooded back in August, right before I released a book called Heart is Not the Same Thing is Bad. <laughs> Like, okay, okay, Lord. Okay. So <laughs> I, the answered prayer that we are about to get, we're not quite there yet, is that we'll be moving back home in a couple of weeks. Ooh, that is so exciting, Abby. Yeah. I'm so glad. Well, when Sean said that was his birthday wish, I'm like, yeah, let's have that come soon, God. Yeah. That would be it awesome. We didn't quite make the birthday book close. Well, that's exciting. I'm glad for you guys. Thanks so much for sharing the journey too, because I think we all face those things where it's like, we want to fast forward to the good news, but you keep encouraging us in the middle of it. And that's been so good. So thank you. Okay, number four, what is one Christian book you make all your kids read besides the Bible? The Hiding Place. The Hiding Place. Okay, growing up, my dad had us read um, The Giving Tree. So even when we were in uh, high school, we had to read this children's book. He was big on generosity. But I think it's always fun to hear. It seems like parents have one book where they're like, kids, this is it. <laughs> you got to read this. Okay, very cool. Number five, would you rather have Jezebel as A, your boss, or B, your mother-in-law? Boss. Boss all day, every day. You can quit. You can quit. <laughs> That's true. Okay. That's so true. All right. And with that, Abby, thank you so much for joining us. Can you just share with everyone where we can connect more with you, where we can find you more beyond this podcast? Absolutely. Yeah. I've blogged at msformama.net for 13 years. There's over 600 blog, blog posts archived there, um, family stuff and recipes and encouragement and scripture. It's like also thrifted outfits. I used to do a bunch of like thrifted outfit stuff. It's the much younger me because I haven't long form <laughs> blogged in a while, but there's a ton of stuff over there. And you can also find my books there and some other resources, like something I call the Gentleness Challenge and um, our Penny Reward System that we use to encourage kind behavior in our kids. And you can find me also on Instagram at m.is.4.mama and Facebook. I'm M is for Mama as well. I also have a podcast called M is for Mama. I keep it easy. And you can sign up for my <laughs> newsletter where I give you a meal plan every single week for free and some encouragement huh? each week. And you can do that at M is for Mama net slash subscribe. I am on that email list and you have helped me a number of times with my dinner plan. So thank you very yes, much for that. So glad to hear it. I love that. <laughs> well, would you mind closing us in prayer, Abby? Of course, I would love to. Lord, thank you for the gift of Christian sisterhood with Bible believing, faithful sisters in Christ who love you and who are committed to preaching your truth to the world and to refuting lies. We need so much of this in our culture, Lord, which is inundated with lies about ourselves, lies about you. And we ask that you would open hearts and minds through this conversation. I am so grateful for Heidi and her boldness to speak truth and her knowledge of scripture. And I am so grateful that you love us enough to reveal your truth to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.